condition is really crazy condition. I mean, I shouldn't give away the whole secret to professional winter. Matteo Yakino giving up to an elbow off his body. Here we go. What a finish. The guy is kind of talking bullshit. The team's just got to work a little harder. Welcome to the Windsurfing Podcast, back again for episode 61. And this week, we have a freestyling legend who moved to Maui at 14 years old, a full pro by 16. Um, he was competing in King of the Lake. He was one of the original freestylers, probably holds the world record for the longest body drag. And he was a dab hand at the old willy skipper. We're going to talk to him about the tour. We're going to talk to him how he quit the tour, went back to college. Going to talk to him about all the old school good stuff. Going to also talk to him what he's doing now and his thoughts on windsurfing today. But before I tell you who it is, I think I need to give you a little intro to his rap. Yes, I did say rap. We're going to kick off this week's show with a windsurfing rap. Who is it? Well, it is, of course, Ian Boyd. Airborne. Ha ha ha. As I'll be a special life away sailing to the 10th degree I lived down Maui for six long years Sailing after school with my peers I grew up in the top 10 Now I go to college and hold up pen Some call me Ian, others call me Boyd Whatever it is, you better avoid yours. Ian, how you doing? Thank you for taking the time Yeah, stoked to be here I'm glad we uh, finally found a popular time to make this happen Hey, I was born at the end of 91, so if I get some stuff wrong, <laughs> make sure you give me shit, okay? Right, of course. <laughs> <laughs> all good. Uh, yeah, we, I always wonder where to start and it kind of always end up starting right at the beginning. You, you grew up like in windsurfing, like you always say in every interview and whatever, you grew up with windsurfing. So I, I guess you took it up really early, like late 70s, early 80s. What was windsurfing back then what was the sport what was the scene you know a lot of probably big boards long boarding but it was changing really quick already right yeah so i mean there's there's a lot to unpack depending on how far you want to go back um i mean for me i might as well just rewind to the beginning you know it's like i i still have the original paper receipt from um from windsurfing you know ink my dad's very first complete windsurfer like it just said boom mass board and um that was uh july middle of july uh 1978 so that's when that's when he started and um yeah it was it was you know all it re kind of regatta racing and just big boards and freestyle and things were just really um um progressing you know quite quickly in terms of, of gear um but he was really active in Southern California, kind of in the, just the local regatta scene. And just due to the nature of me, at the time I was eight years old, uh, I was tagging along everywhere. And at the time, everything was just kind of a standard size rig. There was no cut down rigs or like anything that was specialized or, you know, smaller, except for storm sails um, that had a mast lead with a, you know, that still went up the full length of the mast. Um, but over time, uh, he was also worked at the, the shipyards. He worked with, with metal and his, and his hands a lot and was a, a bit of a builder. And so he made me, uh, some, some, got a cut down sail, cut down the mats, made me some custom aluminum boons and I had like a little rig. And so I was able to kind of get, get started that way. And, um, yeah. And then we were just, you know, my dad, like every weekend we were going somewhere, we were going up to, you know, various lakes down to Baja, just kind of all over California and, and camping and windsurfing. And it was a very like uh, kind of communal sort of sport then. And um, so I was just getting dragged around everywhere. And I started, you know, started doing it and I started getting a little bit recognized because I was like this little kid and there weren't a lot of, you know, really young kids that were, that were windsurfing. So um you know, I think, I think when I was 11 years old, uh, I ended up on the cover of Sailboarder magazine, which was the U S kind of windsurfing magazine. And, uh, I didn't even have foot straps on my board and, you know, no harness. And anyway, so that's kind of where, that's where I got started, you know, was, was, was through my dad for sure. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I just, I started to kind of, you know, grow. He was also, uh, glassing boards and kind of, we were making custom boards and, uh, things were just, 
you know, getting really wild. I mean, you go back and look through the magazines and, uh, it was a, it was a time where, you know, the progression of the gear was really, you know, really taken off. So, um, yeah, I don't know where you want to go from there, but, uh, tell me, tell me, tell me a bit about the, the scene. Like who were, who were the guys back then? Who, who would you look up to? Or like you said, Sailboarder magazine, who was on the cover every month or every, whatever it was probably monthly. Yeah. Like, yeah. uh, Yeah. Who, yeah. What was the, what was the vibe, you know? You know, it was all really the, you know, kind of the, 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 the grandfathers of the sport now, right. It was, it was obviously, it was Matt Schweitzer. It was Mike Waltz. It was Robbie Ash, uh, Ken Winter, um, guys from Kailua. Um, we had the, um, the hang 10 California world cup. I think it was in 80, 81 came to my local beach, um, Cabrillo beach in San Pedro in Los Angeles. And, um, uh, all, you know, European, like everyone descended on this event and it was, you know, they did, uh, they did a little bit of course racing, did slalom. They did a little bit of the waves and some, even some, um, longboard freestyle stuff. And, um, you know, peak arena, like everybody that was, somebody was there. And I was like a, you know, 10, 11 year old kid, just like flipping out. Right. And, uh, so it was, you know, really cool to see those, those guys all come to, you know, your hometown. And, um, so yeah, I was, I was just, I was hooked, you know, I was super passionate. We lived, um, I don't know, six, seven houses from the beach and, uh, you know, the beach I grew up at is not like, you know, Manhattan or, you know, Huntington. It's like it's by the armpit of, of Los Angeles Harbor. And, uh, but it also had the best wind of everywhere on the Southern coast. So everyone would come, um, you know, to, to our beach. And, um, so yeah, it just, you know, every day after school would go down and grab my gear. My dad has a little, some little wheels on a cart he made me and I'd run down the hill and rig up and yeah. You know, kind of no, no, at that point, there's no such thing as like pro sailing or I'm gonna, you know, like, like what was the path? Like you're, you're yeah. okay. You're the best guy at your age. There's nobody pretty much your age. Then you, you, you know, you, you come 12, 13, like Robbie's, Robbie's probably what, like, like five years older or something. Right. So he's, he's kind of trailblazing a little bit. And, um, so, so what's the, you know, what's the outlook like, am I going to go into that sport or, or, or what's up? Yeah, I, I had no, I had no, any, any plan or ambition for that. It was just, I was just stoked and passionate. I just wanted to do it. Right. And like, there was, there was a time where, because I was young, I was, I was uh, cast in this, uh, nature Valley granola bar commercial, you know, uh, windsurfing and I had to do a stunt, which was like, I had to be sailing. And, and then this girl like cut me off and I had to like, you know, throw myself over, you know, over the, the thing and, 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 you know, make it look like I wiped out. And, but anyway, the point of that is that commercial, um, like kind of provided some, some residual income. Um, and, and it was enough where, you know, my family is just super, uh, hardworking blue collar and, you know, didn't really have like tons of money, but that, started to put a little, little bit of money in my bank account. It wasn't a ton, but like for a kid, it was, you know, a lot, but an opportunity came up where we were at another event, I think in 80, it was 80, it was early 84. And, uh, it was up at Halama beach and, um, somebody like Paul Lehman. And I don't know if you know who Paul is, but he, you know, put on all the major events, you know, of windsurfing in the mid, late, early nineties in, in, in Maui. Um, and elsewhere. And so, um, he got in touch with me and he's like, Hey, we're having this junior world wave sailing contest here in Maui early, uh, June of 84. And, um, I, uh, was, was excited about it. And he's like, come on over. We'll, you know, we'll hook you up like in terms of a place to stay. Don't worry about it. And, uh, so I don't know, a month later, I, I got out of school early and I landed on Maui June 5th, 1984 it was on my birthday. And I walked off the plane and the, you know, the, the sea air and, and everything. And I met, uh, I met Paul and he, uh, took me to the beach and connected, um, a few dots with a few local people. And I was only going to be there like a week or two. Um, and you stayed nine months, didn't you? And I, <laughs> uh, yeah, because, it's, it's, it's crazy. but you know, what was really cool back then is, is windsurfing like on Maui. It was, it was, there was such a community, a supportive community. So for that summer, 
um, like I stayed, so I stayed for a couple of weeks with like, or I stayed for like a week with like Kimo Fernie and his buddy from Oahu. And then they went back to Oahu and then, uh, Dan Cohen, who's was a photographer and, you know, again, just, um, uh, windsurfer on Maui that, that Paul put me in touch with. I stayed with him for like a week and then I stayed with Kelbyano for like a week or two. And I stayed with Fred Haywood for two weeks. And before I knew it, like the summer I got passed around, you know, to all these, all these, you know, very kind and supportive people. And, um, the end of the summer was coming along and I was like, I, I got to go home and go back to school. And that's when, uh, Dan Cohen kind of brokered this deal or connected these thoughts with uh, the Sharp family. And they were, they were the first and one of four, um, different host families I lived with and went to high school on Maui. Like they enabled me to, to live there, go to school and go windsurfing every day. So they had a son, um, uh, Eric Sharp. And, uh, Eric was my age, same grade, you know, good windsurfer. And, uh, so it was kind of like, I just had like an instant brother and we went to school every day and then we went to keep after school. And so we kind of did this, this, this triangle and, you know, it was, it was awesome. Right. Because in all fairness, you know, the alternatives at my age where I was growing up were not great. Like it's a, it's a, you know, it's the second or the largest shipping, you know, port in the world. And, you know, there's, there's just lots of drugs and crime and just kind of just gritty gnarliness. And so yeah. I think my dad kind of early on realized it's like, Hey, here's an opportunity for him to go live with a family, do a sport. He was super into windsurfing. He was stoked. Um, get me kind of out of here. And, you know, there's certain rules around all that, all that, like I you know, had to get good grades and I couldn't screw up or I could be on the next flight home. And that I did not like want to mess with because I, w- I was there to windsurf and I was just so grateful to be there that, um, I kind of, you know, got into yeah. a little trouble. Uh, at I, the same time, like you, you mentioned LA being, being like that and, but Hawaii for a lot of teenagers was trouble too. Right. And, you know, as, as, you know, pretty much many famous examples, but I, I also probably a lot of people that were super talented, but, but you never maybe heard of in the, in the surfing or, or windsurfing scene. So how, how's that as a, you know, as a 14 year old kid there, you know, and I guess you were pretty driven from what I understand. Everybody told me like, yeah, the guy had like a clear vision, but, but how, how do you remember? How do you remember that? Yeah. I mean, when I look back on it now, so my son's 15. Um, and I, you know, when he was 14 and I thought about like, yeah, would I, lived, you? <laughs> and a, and part of me is like, I wouldn't want to like deny him, uh, an opportunity. Like I had like that because it was so incredible and it really changed the course of my life forever. I mean, windsurfing really did. Uh, and there's so many people I'm grateful for along the way. But when I think about letting him go do that this day and age, I'm like, maybe not, I, I would think a little harder about it. But then again, isn't it safer though? You have cell phones, you can check in, oh, yeah, you know, back yeah. then it was like, Hey, is he on? Okay. Let's write a letter and right. see in a week if he's fine. Yes. Right? yes. I mean, it's, it, the, the tools now, like I, I can track him on my iPhone. I can, you know, they, yes. So in that sense, the monitoring is, it would, is a lot easier, but maybe we just um, grew softer. <laughs> and then, you know, also, I mean, Maui is, is mature quite a bit too. I mean, I've been, I'm going actually the end of July and I haven't been there in a couple of years, but there's just, there's just a lot more going on for kids too. Right. Like there's, when I was there, there was like one movie theater and the same movie for two months. And there was nothing to do, but go cruise Burger King parking lot, you know, with the locals in their lowered or raised trucks, you know, on a Friday night or go to a party in haiku somewhere. And like, you know, hopefully, you know, someone from school, so you don't get beat up. Um, and so, it, I mean, it's just, it's just, a, it's, it's, it's different now. There's just, there's a lot more going on. And, um, but, um, anyway, so, you know, that happened and I, I lived with the Sharp family for a year. And then, so Eric, myself, the Wetter brothers who were older than us, they were like, you know, uh, junior, senior in high school because we lived in Kihei and we went to the same school and they went to Okeep after school, like the four of us. And there might've been Murray grounds might've even been in there for a while, but we kind of got dubbed as like the Kihei kids. And, um, just cause we were all pretty, pretty young and, you know, going for it, whatever, and showing up after school every day. And so, um, that, you know, was, I was, I was a part of that, uh, for, you know, while it lasted. Um, but that's also when like, 
you know, Eckhart Wagner from, from North sales, he was the owner of North sales windsurfing at the time. Uh, and Patricia Howard, like they came over and kind of saw us, you know, and, and, and then sponsored us as a team. And that's also right when, uh, they also, uh, engaged, uh, Dave Ezzy as their official sale designer, right? Cause Ezzy was making his own sales and then he came on board as like, you know, the North sales designer. And so that was right. That was kind of cool. Cause you know, all of a sudden we had, you know, gear sponsor and, you know, just you go out and break a mask yeah. and go back then you can do that every day if you were really going for it. Yeah. Yeah. So things, things were al aligning, let's say kind of, kind of perfectly. Right. But we're, you know, we're talking as if you are so like super on it and just windsurfing and whatever. And I, <laughs> I called around and Josh Angulo told me like, yeah, you were cool to him. You know, you drove him to school every day. You brought him surfing, whatever. But you also dumped him in the trash can, head down, and and you know, left him in the in the howly hut, and yeah, <laughs> and yeah, all this yeah. kind of stuff. So, so let's not make you too nice no, no, here. No. All right, Listen, I'm not trying to make myself <laughs> as is, like it's like no, no. We definitely did some some hazing, and in all fairness, I love Josh, and in all fairness, he deserves some of it. You know, I mean, he was he you know, was a younger brother, Mark and Andy, and he had a little bit of a mouth on him, and you know how to push buttons, and it got running. And I think we did throw him in the trash can one time. He got pissed. And I remember running away from it, and he just took it and hucked it, and it was like you know, is yeah. Uh, so yeah, there was there was definitely you know some of that, and. You know, I mean, I, you know, I got into a bit of trouble for sure, you know, as any teenage boy would. And so you don't know where the, you know, where the boundary of the edge is until you go over it. And there were, you know, there are a couple little things that happened where I didn't check in and I should have. And, you know, I, you know, skipped school to go surfing. Like I, I tested the waters a little bit, but, you know, I also was I, in the back of my mind. I always knew like, don't fuck this up because like, you yeah. know, this is a, this is a, like a gift that's been handed to you. So, yeah. Yeah. so by yeah. 16, you're like a full-time pro 17, you, you win the O'Neill Invitational, which I think till these days that, that hasn't been broken that record, you know, youngest ever windsurfing is just booming. You're right in the middle of it. The wonder, the, the wonder boy, you know, the upcoming superstar sponsors lining up cash coming in chicks throwing themselves at you. <laughs> Am I painting like a correct picture right here? Yeah. I mean, no, I don't know about the chicks throwing panties at me, but, um, and making a ton of money, but, uh, you know, for, so for me, it went from, it went from that to like, uh, in 87. So I was 16 years old and they had another junior world wave sailing champion. Right. And I, and I, and that was two weeks before the Maria O'Neill, um, the, you know, the, the, the big contest in the spring. And so I won the junior world. And then two weeks later, uh, I was still 16. And, um, I, you know, I don't know how I did it, but I just was like, I don't know. I was felt, felt good about my gear and how I was sailing, but it was a double elimination and it was in, you know, I ended up finishing in pretty decent conditions. And, uh, I somehow went through, I, I, I remember it's like, I, I was up against Pete Carina and I beat him and I was like, holy shit. And then I was up like against Mike Waltz and beat him. I was like, holy shit. And like, I kept going, you know, up. And, and so I hadn't, I hadn't, uh, I didn't go against Robbie in that first round. Uh, but I went, uh, anyway, and I ended up winning in, in, in double elimination with, with Mark. And that's, I think that is what the stamp that kind of put me on, on the map. Right. So then from there it was like, okay, like O'Neill was getting sponsored by wetsuits and clothing and, you know, you know, high tech was, was building boards, but there was, you know, better photo incentives. And then, you know, North was in the mix and I kind of all of a sudden got stepped up into, you know, a little bit more of a legitimate, you know, kind of contracting. I had some friends helping me like read over contracts and that sort of stuff and, and events. But, you know, it's also when, if you were going to be on the world tour, it's like you course raced, you slalom and you did waves, right? My body type or, or size or whatever. I tried, I tried racing. No, it was like, it's like, you know, yeah. there's no slam dunk there. I just didn't have, I just didn't have the, the body type and the weight. And I didn't really have the interest. So I, I kind of, I stepped away, but, um, that's, that's what kind of, I, I would say that's what put me on the map. And then, you know, I started traveling around doing wave events. Um, and then I was also kind of a lot of, a lot of freestyle stuff. Like I was the guy doing pirouette jive, you know, like who needs to do that, you know, <laughs> or, uh, you know, uh, planning, planning duck tax and, and other things. Um, but during that time I realized because I wasn't going to be kind of a model, you know, 
PWA guy that I started to, you know, uh, kind of cultivate this, this, um, this, uh, this kind of instructional idea. So it was like working with Eric Ader or Daryl Long or whatever, and I was shooting sequences on how to do moves and then writing articles. And then it wasn't just the U S magazines, but it was, you know, it was, it was boards in England. It was planish in France. It was surf surfing. It was like, I, I was working with like eight or 10 different magazines around the world. And we were duplicating the slides. These are slides nothing digital. Right. And I was, I was like, faxing, you know, the thing and then, and then, yeah. So it was that, but I was trying to build a little bit of this, you know, instructional thing. And then I, I worked on a couple instructional videos through, through North and, uh, one of my dearest friends, you know, Craig Atkins, who was the, the filmmaker on those. And, and so it was like tricks of the trade, Nairborn, and then not to go too far forward, but then, you know, it was like, I was starting to do, uh, like, you know, clinic tours around the, the country when I had breaks. And certainly that's what kind of kept me going through college, you know? So anyway, not to jump too far ahead, but that's, um, that was uh, when things I like, started getting sponsors, traveling, uh, being recognized as kind of one, one of the guys, you know, um, in the mix. And so um, it was a fun time, though, man. I mean, it was like I look back on the, the mid to late 80s. And for me personally, those are the golden, golden years of windsurfing. That's when there was like just so much excitement, enthusiasm, and there was tons of innovation and gear. There were sponsorships like, oh, this contest, $250,000, you know, prize money and going down to whatever 16th, whatever it was. But there was just, there was a lot of, of, of interest. Um, and it's just, it, it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, yeah. So what, so, so what would you like, let's say you had this, the spring Maui contest would open the season and then you would go, I don't know, off to Japan and then summer in Europe and then the whole thing. Right. And like you say, like contests where, were huge and you know there was outside industry sponsors right right Siggy's beer whatever Peter Stoyvesan all this all this stuff right that for for us for my generation is like almost abstract right now you know but um you so 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 obviously you know you get on tour you travel a lot and you said somewhere like that traveling at a such a young age like really opened your eyes, really, you know, helped you grow. And obviously we're going to discuss the financial aspect and all this, but, um, but grow as a person, you know, grow as a, as a human being. How, how so, how, how do you remember that? Like, cause it must've been, yeah, must've many times we actually don't appreciate it. I think, you know, as you, you just get it as this young kid, you don't know any different. You just, that that's your, your reality right now. So how was it with you? Yeah. Um, I, when I look back on it at the time, I probably didn't appreciate it as much as I do now or, or, or should have, but when you're young, that's how it goes. Uh, but you know, when you get out of your kind of, you know, your community or bubble, whatever, what it's Maui or wherever you, you live and you're, you're traveling and, you know, just interacting with, with people and cultures, like there's, there's no better gift you can give somebody in life than the gift of travel. Right. Like I've always told my kids, I'm like, you know, if we ever won the lottery or look at a windfall, like, we're not buying a bunch of shit or a bigger house. It's like, we're, we're traveling and selfishly, I want to go with you because it's like, no matter how sick or healthy or rich or poor or whatever, at the end of the day, when I sit back and I think back to all the places I've been and the people I've met and the, in some of the incredible, like, you know, friendships that I still have today, it's all because of travel and, you know, travel does take some, it, it's, you know, it takes some, some resources for sure. And, you know, when you're sponsored and someone's like paying for, you know, for travel, you may not appreciate it at the time, but like, it's, it's pretty cool. So I, even to this day, it's like, I, I, when I think about what I want to spend any extra money on, it's, it's a trip. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's experience. Yeah. So you'd go to all these places, right? Right. Like in Europe, you, the sport is booming. You're, you're a freaking star, you know, Caribbean, Japan, same thing, you know? And sponsors tell you to, you know, to do contests, but also trade shows and also promotional stuff and whatever. And rumor has it, you were almost like borderline forced to go party. I mean, <laughs> like that was, that was kind of part of the package, wasn't it? Well, yeah. So when you, when you start to get a bit of notoriety, like 
you know, at one point, I think when we were going through uh, bins and bins of magazines with my kids and I was like, OK, what's what's in this issue that is interesting that we should cut out and keep and throw the rest away? Because I just been carting this stuff around my whole life. I think we counted like, I don't know, 40 something covers of magazines and you know all this sort of stuff. But when you start to kind of get that sort of exposure, I felt like, yeah, where, wherever I went uh, and it's, it's really nice, but but people want to show you a good time. Like when you come to their hometown in Italy or Germany or wherever you are, South Africa, like they want to show you a good time, which may include like, let's go out and drink. Let's go out, like take you to the strip clubs. I'm like, I, okay. I mean, I don't know if I need to go to a strip club tonight, but this is the best one in, you know, Vancouver. Let's go. Like, you know, so, um, yeah, there were, there was, there was a lot of that. And I, you know, I leaned into it. Um, and you know, in hindsight, it's at times maybe a little too much. And, uh, there were, there were some things that I kind of made some, some bad, some, some bad choices that, um, you know, kind of got me in trouble. I mean, we were at, uh, King of the, King of the Lake, um, in Italy and, and like, uh, uh it was on, on, on Lago de Garda and it was, uh, I think the summer of 96. And I was like the freestyle guy before, like freestyle was really something, um, you know, doing my kick flips and body drags and, you know, whatever. Um, I was a little cocky and I was like, I, I could probably win this thing. You know, like it was like, yes, Kevin Pritchard was there. I think Robbie Seeger was there. And then I, beyond that, I, I didn't really, those are maybe my two biggest things, but I thought I was more free of a freestyle guy. Right. So, um, I went out and we were raging and just getting after it. And, you know, in the morning, the, the owner of the, the hotel comes and pounds on the door. They're like, they're, they're calling for you. They're looking for you. I go, okay, I'll come down at breakfast. They're like, no, no, no. Like you need to get to the beach. I'm like, yeah, okay. Well, you know, I'll, I'll get there. And I was just taking my time. They came back and then, cause there were no cell phones. Right. Like it just, it was like, anyway, I was so cocky to think there's no way they're going to start the contest without me. And apparently my heat was like one of the first up. So we finally get down there and I'm walking down the plank and people are looking at me like, shit, he's, he's here. And I look out on the water and there's three sails and I'm like, I'm, and they're just, they're just bobbing along. Right. I'm like, it's not windy enough yet. They're just out, you know, whatever. And someone comes up and they're like, yeah, this is your heat right now. I go, Oh, that's really funny. You know, it's sure. Yeah. Whatever. And then the closer I got to like the event, people kept looking at me saying that. And it was like a minute left. They didn't even have time to grab gear. I go, you're kidding me. Right. They're, they're not even planning. Like, how are you doing a freestyle event? Whatever. But they wanted to get the thing done that day or something. And bah, heat's over. And I was like, and so I had like, I think Martin Brandt, like I had, I had sponsor there and it just was, it was a, it was bad. It was not a, you know, one of my best professional performances, but I, 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 I lost. <laughs> what was, what was Martin Brandt there reaction? <laughs> I, you know what? I, I think he was there, but it, it was so long ago, but I remember somebody from North, definitely somebody. Hey, um, from I told you, I told yeah, you that I you was, have to be no, professional. It, it was just you have to party, head. but you have to come up at 7 a.m. <laughs> for your heat. It was just a look of just disappointment. I don't think there were any words exchanged. And then and then I made some big claim, like something like if anyone can beat me in the in the uh, expression session, because they would they would take that boat and go back and forth to, with the wake, you know, and I'm on like a five, seven hungover pumping, trying to get like two feet of air off a wake and you know, whatever. It just it was. <laughs> not a great event. So there, there are a couple things like that, but, but the point is, is yes, there was, there was quite a bit of, um, of encouragement, uh, not necessarily directly from my sponsors. Like we want you to party. It was just like, it was, you know, people are there on vacation. They're there to celebrate. They're there to be at the event, stay on the event, you know, and it just turned into that, you know? So, so, so which place showed you the best time? Give me your, give me your top three. Cape Town. I, we had, I, had a, I had a pretty raging time in Cape Town. That's that's for sure. That's that's in there. Um, I know there was a night at Ispo Trade Show in Dusseldorf or something that was pretty memorable. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I we had some pretty raging nights in, in Garda too that that were that were pretty fun. But it wasn't like oh, was that a Biza? Like it, you know. Um, I don't know. I could, probably, I could probably come with some better examples. I you know dug deep. This is thirty plus years ago. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and in terms of sailing, like it was like you say, like late eighties, beginning of nineties, crazy progression time. Who do you remember like making like the biggest impression on you? Like, who's this guy? Like what, what what's going on? Like, did you ever feel like you're, you're behind the curve? Like, I mean, you're, you're young, you're in your, you know, 
teens and early twenties, but the sport's progressing so fast. And well, do you remember something, somebody that really like, whew, yeah, I mean, it was, I, I do remember, I felt like I was never like on the cutting edge. I was always kind of like catching up, but it was, it was a lot of the usual suspects. Like, of course, you know, Mark and Gulo and the waves, and Rush Randall and, you know, all the other guys, I don't want to name, I'll leave too many out, but they were, you know, all really, you know, pushing wave three sixties and, um, you know, Polo Cal came along and, you know, he was sailing, you know, faster, jumping higher, more aggressive, you know, bashing the lip, you know, on bigger waves. I'd be like, I don't think I would, I wouldn't have gone on that. Like, you know what I mean? And, and pulling it on. And so there were, um, you know, there were, there were definitely a lot of guys doing that. You know, the, the freestyle thing wasn't really a thing yet. Right. Like it, it was just kind of starting. Like, I mean, in 92, I think they had like the killer loop in, in killer loop classic in the gorge. And then there was, you know, there's a couple of little things on Garda and uh, some smaller events. I went to something in, in Tenerife, I think with uh, one of the um, fr French windsurfing survey magazines, but once, but, but freestyle was it, it was just kind of starting. Uh, but in terms of like, you but know, you were scoring like transitions and waves and stuff. You could, you could like freestyle stuff could get you somewhere. Yes, right. Yes. Yeah. And I always, you know, definitely put an emphasis on that. Like I would, you know, if I could like, you know, do like, you know, a planning duck tack, that was my go-to or a nice duck jive or uh, the snap jive or, a, you know, whatever. So I, I definitely in the transitions, I cared about transitions where a lot of wave guys were like, they just jumping in waves and they just would do the same, you know, pivot jive every time because they didn't, you know, wasn't something they wanted to really focus a lot of their time on. Um, so, um, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So the freestyle, I mean, to, to quote your beautiful rap from the airborne video, <laughs> I, <laughs> I know, there. I know I wasn't supposed to do it, but <laughs> just one, just, just, just one line. Oh gosh. So, so just <laughs> specialize in wave sailing to the 10th degree, right? Yeah. That was yeah. So that's a but, but you are like the original, like you mentioned, you're the like original freestyler, like, and like what, what was the mindset? Cause you're, you know, like waves and, and all this, but back in the windsurfer time, yeah, there was some freestyle with this weird light wind stuff. And then you just, you just stumbled upon something and invented a couple moves or like, how, how does one just decide, okay, like this is my niche, you know? Cause it's, it's interesting. Everybody's doing something. And then you just made your whole thing, like the freestyler, you know, the, the, like, the one, you know, so how, how'd you, how'd you decide to do that? Well, yeah, it just, it kind of happened because again, I was like, I, I, I knew I needed to be more than just a full-time like Maui wave guy. And I wasn't ever going to do racing. And, um, I, I kind of, I kind of enjoyed it a bit and it never was something like, Oh, I'm going to, you know, glom onto this. And this is going to be my thing. Uh, it just, I was just, it, it was more interested in taking uh, combinations of things and putting them together. And, you know, we're, you know, doing a, like a board spin on the wave face before it starts breaking. Or, you know, I was, you know, I, I pretty early on and we have video and photos, but I would, I would like kind of bottom turn and do a duck jive and be up clue first and then go up into a 360. And it wasn't like it pulled a lot, but I was doing that out the back and then kind of having this weird, you know, it never came back in the face, but like was doing these weird kind of rotations and, I, you know, it was, especially when I kind of figured that the, so the, the freestyle focus, if you will, like kind of really for me was when I realized that, okay, I'm, you know, 19, 20 years old and I'm looking at, at windsurfing and kind of my future, the next two years, five years, 10 years. And I think I realized that, um, I need to have something to fall back on. And nobody in my family had ever gone to college. And I also kind of knew that I had this window and if I didn't take advantage of it, it, I probably never would. And I, that became that, my, that became my focus where I was like, okay, I think I need to go to college. Cause I, after high school, I took three years and I was just tr you know traveling around and competing and it was a great lifestyle. And it was a lot, you know, it was a lot of fun and the whole thing, but, um, it wasn't gonna, it wasn't gonna last forever. So uh, that, well, that's when I kind of made the decision. I went to California the, the summer before and I was like, all right, for me to go to school somewhere, which I, I never liked school. I just, it was always a struggle for me. Um, 
never really excelled at it, struggled, whatever. Um, I was like, I need to be, I need to find somewhere where I'm going to be happy living. Cause if I'm happy living somewhere, I'll be probably do better in school than if I'm back East and it's cold and shitty and whatever. Um, so borrowed a buddy's car, started in San Diego and went up to Santa Cruz and I stopped, you know, I stopped in Los Angeles. I stopped in Santa Barbara, um, stopped in, you know, Cal Poly and, and San Luis Obispo and, and Santa Cruz. And I just hooked up with or connected with people I knew and, um, was like, you know, just, do I like it here? Like, you know, cause I was born, born and raised in California for the most part. But, um, you know, it's like when you visit somewhere, it's different than if you stay for a couple of weeks or really check it out. Like, could I live here? So anyway, I, I settled on Santa Barbara. That's how we got there. And, um, but it was like, how do I keep my, if you want to call it a career, but how do I keep you know, my sponsorship, like, where's my value add now? And it's like, I'm not living on Maui anymore. And if I'm going to go to college, how am I going to keep this going? And so, um, North sales was actually super cool. They're like, we like, you know, I, I don't know if the vision was someday. Yeah, like, we, we're not only going to pay the, we're not going to only pick up the, the strip club tub. We also going to, going to pay for you to go to college. Right. Which is yeah. unheard of, which is insane. Uh, to be honest, like that's, that's crazy, you know? Yeah. And so the, the cool thing was it was like, it was a reduced, you know, monthly stipend, right? Like I didn't have my full thing. Um, but you know, I was sponsored. I had gear, I had a little monthly stipend and then Eckhart had written in my contract, um, very, you know, there's like a couple paragraphs that are very specific that if you get a this certain GPA and you, you know, you're in good standing and the whole thing, we will, we will, pay, you know, this amount towards your college. And, you know, it was, um, I mean, it was like, wow, this is this to your point, like, it's pretty incredible that, you know, that somebody would, would do that. And so, but along the way, it's like, yes, when I had spring breaks, I wasn't going partying in Mexico. It was like, I was going on the East coast and doing these clinic tours and up in Canada and like, you know, and around. So, um, I was available for photo shoots and, you know, still writing articles and I was doing instructional videos and I was doing all this sort of stuff to just, kind of keep my, you know, cause you know, maintaining your quote brand and, and your exposures, you know, totally different now. Right. than it was back then you were relying on magazines and like videos and, um, you know, the, the time to market on that stuff is, you know, is so much longer than it is now. Right. Like you can go out and just have a ripping day at Hokipa and come back and just edit it and have that thing online, you know, and before yeah. midnight. And sure. so, um, yeah. yeah. So, so let's talk about this moving to, to, because it, it was kind of a pretty, I guess it was a pretty big deal. You have this, you know, 19, 20 year old phenom, you know, winning contests, traveling around the world, doing stuff, you know, and, and like really high profile. And then he just says like, okay, I'm going to get an education. I'm going to move away from Maui. And like you say, like Maui was groundhog day anyway. You missed social life. You didn't really, you know, like, so like, I don't know. It's, it's, did you, did you feel like this might be a, a, a bad decision or was it like, yeah, okay. Nobody of my family, like you say, nobody of my family went to college. Like how much certainty there was behind that? Cause it, it, it seems, you know, at that time from what's described to us, windsurfing was a hell of a career. I mean, you were making six digits probably easily. Right. Uh, well, in, in terms of that, I mean, I, the, the guys that were making six digits in that range were definitely the guys that were like, you know, leading the, 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 the tours and stuff. Right. I, um, I, at one point, I think for a few years when I had Oxbow, which was a great sponsor, um, actually I still wish I could have access to their clothes now, but back then I was like, wait, what? These are the funkiest things ever, uh, between North Oxbow O'Neill and some of the other little things, maybe some contest earnings. I mean, at the time, I mean, I, I think on the best years, I might have had made like 80 grand or something, which doesn't sound like a lot in today's terms. Um, but, but right now, today, it's probably like, well, if you, if you convert to now, it's what, like two, three hundred grand, right? If you take like inflation and stuff into the equation. And yeah, I mean, it's, 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 you know, it's good money. But, but when you have your travel paid and you've, you've, you know, you've got this coming in, I mean, I, so I bought my first house on Maui when I was 19. And that was, you know, that, that was kind of cool. I, did, I didn't live in it. I, I bought it and rented it out, but it was just, it was nice to have, you know, something like be able to have something like that, you know, in the mix. And, um, but it was for me, when surfing was never really about the money, you know, it was a means to like it, it enabled a great lifestyle. And, 
I knew I was never going to get rich, you know, doing it or, um, yeah, it, it was, it was, it, I, I, for me personally, I, I, I saw like it had a, it had a timeline on it. I didn't know when that was, if I decided to stay and continue and how my, you know, sailing or the sport or myself, how it would have, you know, morphed. But for me making the decision to go to college was, I realized that that, you know, potentially setting me up for the rest of my life, probably more than windsurfing is, was. Um, and so I just, I made the decision. It's like, Hey, you know, if I don't do this or it doesn't work out. Probably always come back. You know, it's not, I don't know windsurfing for me. And like probably most people listening to this is like riding a bike, right? Like y- y- you didn't do it for a year. You can, you can get on and, and, and just whatever. Oh, okay. So yeah, I, I, I don't know other than, you know, there were external factors. Like I just, I just wanted to check that box. And I, I realized it didn't have a lot of time. If too much time went by, I wasn't going to be a, you know, a 28 year old guy, you know, freshman in college, just, I had, I had yeah. to do it. I had to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, which, yeah, nobody of the, of the, even the generation after you, you know, like if you look at the Pola cows and the Pritchards and whatever, they kept going till well in their forties, you know, or, or in their forties. So, so it's, yeah, I guess, there was no blueprint though then right you were just like fully yeah yeah that's what i want to ask about like because everything when i when i spoke to people that followed you back then and and that you know grew up um watching your stuff and whatever you have this kind of happy go lucky vibe right like okay there's a party there okay we're gonna freestyle here okay i'm gonna whatever do do this that but it sounds pretty actually calculated from what you're hearing now, obviously you're looking at, at it analytical from, from perspective. Right. But you remember that like, okay, today I'm going to be, you know, today, today we're going to have a rage day, but tomorrow we're going to be serious and we're going to do that. Like, how, how's that? Yeah. I think it's just in my DNA. It's like, I've got kind of a, a work hard, play hard mentality. Like I've got a really strong work ethic when I'm, when I'm focused and want, want something or want to want to get something done. Like I apply myself and it's, you know, it's historically proven to like to work out. Um, I also have a, you know, a de- definitely some, some, some built in DNA to that are, you know, it's kind of on the party side. Like I like to be with people and be social and have a good time. And, you know, for me, it may not be, not be the best, but a lot of times that evolves around, you know, like drinking and like, you know, and raging. And the, the problem is, is over time, over your life, uh, the more you do that, the more people associate that with you. So even like there was, uh, see what my mom had. Okay. So, but, but it wasn't, it wasn't at that time. It wasn't a bad thing. I, I just, I don't know. I feel like nowadays we're athletes and we're not supposed to do that. But back then it was kind of counterculture. You guys were yeah. like counterculture type thing. Right. And it was almost uh, a part of it or, uh, or, you know, it was as important that bad boy image as, as, as you're sailing. Right. Yes. Yes. And, and keep, I mean, keep in mind back then, it's like, there might've been a few people that, that, that like trained, but like training wasn't even my vocabulary. I just went windsurf, right? Like I didn't have a nutritionist and a, you know, someone working me out and, and, you know, doing all this stuff. It was just like, I just went and sailed. That was my training. And so there was no real blueprint or guidance on any of that. And, you know, you see that in a lot of sports now, like surfing, right? Like you know, there's coaches and, you know, all kinds of different programs you can subscribe to. But like back then, yeah, I mean, it was kind of like there was, to, to your point, there was, um, that was encouraged, you know, that kind of behavior and that image. And there were definitely people that, you know, leaned into it publicly, you know, harder than others. I knew that like, I was, I was in the mix a bit, but I also was always conscious, like, how could this possibly affect, you know, my, I'll say my gravy train, but like my, you know, my sponsorship and my outcome, because I didn't have a backup plan. I didn't have a third factor. I wasn't a trust funder. I wasn't, didn't have rich parents. It was like, it was, it was me. Like, so I didn't want to, I didn't want to mess that up. So I always kind of like push it to the edge, but like now with everybody has a, you know, a phone or a camera in their hand, you got to be a little bit more conscious about like what you're doing and what you're saying, because it can be broadcast to the world, you know, forever in seconds. Yeah. The new gen, the, like the generation below me, let's say the younger, they're so conscious of that. It's, it's nuts. But anyway, so, so I guess that's where, 
where the movies come in. What what I really want to talk about because that's when I when I spoke to people like now, let's say in their forties, late late thirties, forties, whatever. That's where they associate you. Like, ah, oh, I used to watch Ian on on VHSs and and Northbound and Northbound comes up all the time and Airborne and all these <laughs> and all that's these so things. Yeah, and like, how did that? come about because you were probably one of the first guys doing that like it wasn't a thing yet like let's go out and make movies right it it was it was kind of something something new and i mean there was no windsurf cinematographers or there was no production companies and there was you know you know what i mean of that kind of stuff windsurfing was was one of the only extreme sports there was and like how how does one put a movie together and I don't know, 1990, you know? Yeah, no, you're, you're, you're absolutely right on all those points. Um, you know, so back then, um, you know, video production was like just not even an option to getting into it for anyone. Cause it was so cost prohibitive, right? Hundreds of thousands of dollars and cameras and beta decks and, you know, all these sort of things. But I would say the, 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 the one person that really kicked that off on Maui at the time was, was Dave Nash, right? When he got a beta cam and was you know, running around you know, shooting all his, all his buddies, you know, all the best guys in the world. Um, and then, you know, North contracted him to do video work and, and, and others. Um, he, uh, you know, I think he partnered with, with Mike Waltz, um, on on a lot of that, but, uh, he's the one that really like kind of helped like bring, you know, those visuals to VHS and, um, I don't know if I'm, I'm answering your question in terms of like putting it together, but, uh, but North, you know, with, with Northbound and some of their other films and, you know, eventually, you know, Neil pride and, you know, uh, uh, masters, what was his first name? But he did all the Robert, Neil pride Robert, Robert, Robert masters. Yeah. Um, yeah, just, it was just kind of starting, you know, then, and that's all we like had to like, you know, go out, you know, um, the only exposure we had to like seeing what was going on, you know, it was, was video, but, uh, I don't know. I just tried to get in, involved as much as possible. And, you know, I've always been, well, I should say always, I've been surrounded by, you know, photographers and filmmakers most of my life. And I've always had an interest in that. And it wasn't until later life that I realized that, you know, I have a decent eye, you know, for, for composition and, uh, exposure and action. And so I started picking up cameras myself. Um, but back then I just, I, I liked the guys that were behind them and I, and I liked the, the cameras and I was, you know, was happy to, you know, be in the mix and, you know, uh, be on camera. So I, I try to put my pl- myself in those places, you know, as much as possible. Okay. Let's stop being so, so polite. Give me your best wildest story from filming Northbound. I mean, you had a beer sponsor for that. I think that says a lot. <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, we had some Sierra Nevada. We actually stopped at their headquarters and picked up cases of beer. Uh, no, that was, that was a lot of fun. And so my, uh, college like, uh, uh, quarter or semester had just ended. And this is like the middle of June. And, uh, it was Sean Ardonez, Matt Pritchard, Leon Bellinger, myself, it was, uh, in the motor home and Bob was this, uh, kind of, uh, German intern guy that came over from North sales windsurfing, but picked up this motor home and stickered it up in LA and then came and picked, drove to Santa Barbara. We all descended there, loaded our gear. Um, Dave Nash and his, uh, camera, camera guy were in a truck kind of following us. And like the wheels like came off the bus. Like for me, it was like, done with college, going on this killer road trip with all these guys they are, you know, ripping wind servers, meeting up with, you know, some of our other friends, you know, uh, Peter Tro and Howie Green and, you know, and, and Ben Williams and all that. And so, but we we're also going to really cool spots. Like, you know, going to Halama, we we're stopping at all these coastal spots along highway one. And I was just, I was kind of in a bit of a rager mode, you know, like I'd keep it together. Certainly in the morning we'd sail, but like when we were done sailing for the day, it was like, we got to, but Matt Richard hated us. I mean, cause we were just so loud and just cranking dunes and just, yeah, getting, getting rowdy in, in the moho. And, uh, it, it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. It was like 10 or 12 days on the coast. And we got really lucky because everywhere we went, it was it like seems windy and wavy every spot you went. How's yeah. that even possible? 
And on a different week when they, the coast could have been fogged in the whole way, wah, wah, wah. But we somehow just scored, you know, ended up getting all the way up to the gorge. But we, uh, that was, that was a great trip. I'd love to, you know, do another one of those someday. Um, Hey, so you, so young Marty P was a little, a little stuck up a little, uh, well, he, you know what? He was just hyper-focused on, he was, a, he's, he was, he's a massive great guy. I, I, I love Matt to this day, but he was being very, um, straight edge. Like he wasn't participating at all, which is fine. But if you're not participating and most everyone else around you are, it's like, it can get a little annoying, but I could just tell him, you remember a couple of times we were like, Oh my God, dude, Matt went in this tent, you know, with his book, you know, and, and it was like to get away from us. And we're like, I remember, uh, Leon, they had like, uh, he, we had just gotten Snoop Dogg's like new, you know, new CD and he was just cranking it over and over. And it was just, yeah, we were, we were going for it. And we were sailing hard every day and then we were just kind of raging hard every night. So what's not to like about that when you're, you know, I don't know, 22 yeah. years old. For sure. For sure. But you gotta like, you know, you went from kind of contests, you did contests that time as well, but you know, into like more image stuff and movies. And I think what people don't, don't get is that in, in movies and in, 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 you know, creating content and whatever, you got to perform as well. Right. Do you, how, how do you compare that? Cause you, yeah, you seemed, you know, you had an amazing run of, of what we call now content creation. Right. But, um, uh, how, how was your mindset? Like, did you like get stressed? Oh, I need to get, you know, cause it sounds, this Northbound thing sounds amazing, you know, but there for sure, like you want to sail the hardest out of everyone. You want to freaking, you know, get the best movie parts you want to. Yeah. I don't know. Just like chalk it up to just kind of being young and, and going for it. And I, I never would be one that if I, if I went too hard the night before, I wouldn't be like, Oh, I'm tired or I'm hungover. I would always rally. Like I just, that's, that's kind of the one thing I've, I've kind of deal I've made with myself. If I, if I overdo it or someone overserves me, um, I will never complain about the, the, the consequences or the, the aftermath They just get up and go. So Hey, hey, the best hangover cure, I think, is a is a is a good good pounding in cold water. That's like, right. Yeah. <laughs> like no, the California is. coast. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Um these movies, they're kind of like I mentioned before, you know, to 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 everybody I, I ask, they're kind of your legacy, you know. You're like a, like as it comes out of this interview, like a super aware guy did you have it in the back of your mind like okay this is gonna last forever this is my like my legacy you know and everybody told me like ah it's such a you know they're they're raging hard they're partying i ah, watch this movie blah, blah. and then i'm like ah it's actually you know it's it's pretty it's just fun you know it's it's not like crazy but were you aware of that at the time i don't think so i was just i uh, kind of living in the moment, you know, wasn't really looking too far ahead and, uh, just, just happy to be there going for it. I, I don't know. Um, I, I really wasn't, wasn't aware of, 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 you know, if that is a, a stamp or, or, or a legacy yeah. just, uh, but I didn't really have any, you know, ideas like, Oh, I want to make, you know, yeah, I was the only things I was really, you know, kind of, scripting were, you know, kind of instructional videos, like thinking, Oh, how can I help people do some of these moves that, you know? Yeah. Uh, let's write a, let's write a rap to promote it. Right. <laughs> yeah, no, the, the rap was encouraged. The rap is good. Don't, don't get, don't, don't get, you know, you seem embarrassed, but it's, it's well, it's you know, it's just, it's just bad. It's just bad rapping. It's bad lyrics, but it's like, it was meant to be a, like a personality opener, right? Like how do we do this montage? And it was like, at the time it's like, you know, I listened to a lot of rap and, and or a lot of hip hop and um, it just, I don't know, I came up with the lyrics and then our, the my producer guy was like, I've got a you know a friend with a studio, we could record it. And I was like, oh yeah, it'd be a great idea. And then, you know, and then it, it, it's, it's fine. It's just, when I look back on that, I'd rather that not, you know, be something that is like, oh yeah. Career <laughs> <You're> defining, <laughs> or yeah, rap. legacy. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. So, um, but you know, yeah. we... I don't know. We had fun with it at the time. I was young. I'm sure we've all at my age looked back on stuff we did at that age and been like, uh. yeah, to anyone that's wanting to see it, it's on YouTube. It's just airborne young boy. Sadly. <laughs> hey, 
you had a couple like um well let's let's put it this way what's from that time what was your like top three signature promo stunts you would pull off because we hear you love to sail you you love to sail naked you know ch- chug a beer while uh while sailing backwinded back to sail and uh, that kind of stuff what, what was your go-to oh gosh um probably you know yeah probably just you know sailing in the harness with one foot off the side you know barefoot water skiing style you know did that did that a lot or you know body drags um like like go-to move like what what would More i do like or, go to like you know yeah stunt like I mean, go to <laughs> yeah yeah i mean say, say like naked was just kind of one of those you know dumb you know hey look at me um sort of novelty things i did you know i don't know every every year somewhere just just for shock value got you but on mtv also, though <laughs> yeah yeah no yeah no i made it on that H- <laughs> mtv segment um yeah for sure but um yeah, there's nothing that really stands out where uh, yeah. I was, you know, like doing my b-boy stance, like you know, somewhere or whatever. Um, yeah. So, so when you moved back to 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 mainland US, you also like opened a little screen printing business and kind of like, you know, a, a, a lot of let's say self management with all the, you know, with all the magazines. And, and all that stuff. And you even describe yourself like, like overcommitted juggling the shit ton of things, you know, like from someone that does a lot of stuff, you know, two tours, basically YouTube podcasts, <laughs> sponsor projects, whatever. What's, what's your best advice? How to, how to juggle a lot of projects at once, a lot of projects. <laughs> Uh, you're probably asking the wrong person because I suffer from major adult like ADD. So I've got just too many things going in different directions at all times. You know, I mean, the one thing that, that keeps me uh, organized is I, I'm old school. Like I have like a yellow notepad and a pen and I just write shit down on it. And then, you know, the, the next night or the next morning, I look at it, circle cross stuff off and I make a fresh one. It's the, um, you know, I try and do it on my phone. It's, it's, it works sometimes, but I just, if I don't write stuff down, like prioritize stuff. I'm like, Hey, look at that shiny thing over here. And, oh, wow. Yeah. You know, I got to back up that hard drive and then, Oh, this can't like, I'm all over the place. Um, but when I, when I am like hyper-focused on something that's, you know, like from editing a project or whatever, that's when I, you know, can, can get shit done, but I'm not great at juggling stuff anymore. I just, it's, um, yeah. I mean, got to stay organized and, and write it down. Yeah. Um, so out of out of all those movies, would you would you ever imagine that basically like, you know, 20, 20, 30 years later, like it will lead you to to, you know, to become a, a filmmaker yourself, to, you know, was that you said you were, you know, you realized that you were pretty good with with seeing stuff maybe other people don't, right? Yeah. Uh no, not at the time, but um you know, what really got me started in like film production and is I, uh, connected with a friend that was uh, really into these little Sony triple nine, uh, cameras, these POV cameras. And keep in mind, this is 10 years before GoPro was even, you know, on the map and it was all hardwired, a little Canon decks. And it was like all, everything was customized. You know, we had Pelican flashlight housings, which were the housing for the thing. And it just, it was so clunky and cumbersome and stuff was always dropping out and breaking. And if you landed a jump too hard and shut the tape off, like it was really difficult to get shots. And that's probably why it was a huge barrier to entry too, because you'd go up and you'd, you know, hit record and shut everything up and put it in the little custom harness thing I had and go out and you'd like, you know, you know, for a half hour and come in and figure out, you know, find the things, you know, shut off at, at five minutes, you know, and you're like, damn. So it was, um, I, I, but I was really, I was just chasing it because the footage was so cool, you know, because you were on board, you had that perspective and I was doing all kinds of different mounts and, you know, you can ask any of the guys from the very, very early tight beach days, you know, I was down there, you know, putting, putting my gear, you know, on all those guys flash and, 
Lou or Lou and Elliot. And, and so I, um, you know, then also started get, kind of getting into bigger camera stuff too. Um, but I didn't really have a, a plan or a vision for like, Oh yeah, I want to be a videographer, photographer, filmmaker, but it, it came over time. And like anything that you're passionate about, right? Like you always put in, you don't even put it in. You just, you, it's just hours and hours just accumulating learning and testing and readjusting. And I was really into building mounts and my dad would help me too, because you know, he used to build mounts on battleships. Like that was his thing. So I'd be like, I want to put the camera out here, but I don't know how to stabilize, you know, connect it and everything. And we'd come up with something and you know, a lot of times it worked great. Sometimes it'd break, you know? So I, um, yeah, I just, I just really, you know, was, had an eye and a passion for it. It just kind of turned into, you know, a career that it is today. You know, it's like, I'm, you know, so I work for an ad agency as, you know, the main content guy in the studio. And I've got a lot of studio experience with products, um, both video and photography, and then, you know, a lot of BTS and, and kind of feel good pieces. And so I, you know, it's what I do full time. Um, and it's, yeah. uh, what, what, what's the coolest thing you've, you've sat behind the camera for? Like my, my list was like, NBA stars, Travis Scott, 3D porn. That's the three things I... <laughs> I yeah, so... Uh, no, yeah, well, probably one of the most memorable ones was I was shooting a bunch of uh, BTS for a national broadcast commercial for uh, NBA 2K. And it was, it was, a, it was featuring um, LeBron James and Travis Scott was there and he had a small part in it. But we had an opportunity for the social team to like, like hustle. And it was right when LeBron had, had signed with the Lakers and right when Travis Scott was coming out with his, his new album, Astro World, like those, like in that week. So you had like the biggest two stars, you know, at the top of their game, uh, LeBron interviewing Travis Scott on his new album. And I was the only one that like, had the lights on, had two cameras and just, there was no time to react. I had my sound guy there, but we hit record and it was just, and then I got to, you know, edit it and it got pushed out to everything. And it was probably one of my most viewed and also just kind of cool pieces. Like at the end of the day, um, now, so I work, I work with the same company or the a, a video game company and, um, I work alongside like their in-house, you know, so their high profile influencer. And so I, sh I shadow him and his job is to be you know, like, uh, just engage and, 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 and cultivate and, you know, manage these relationships with, with celebrities, athletes, and musicians. And so I'm around a lot of, you know, pretty famous people, but at the end of the day, you know, at the end of the day, it's like, I respect what they do, you know, and their craft, but I don't give a shit that it's, you know, machine gun Kelly and, you know, whatever. I mean, they're just people. I mean, they're, they're cool. They're kind of interesting, but I'm not like, <gasps> You know, so I, I've shot a lot of, a lot of NBA stars, a lot of golf pros, um, you know, some of the more memorable work I've done, believe it or not, was with, um, um, a, a, a um, a Blue Shield of California. So they're, they're like medical insurance and it sounds pretty dry and boring, but it's like real people with real stories. And, you know, you've got women dying of cancer, you've got all kinds of different things. And those stories are actually pretty cool because they're human and they kind of mean something to me. Um, you know, not just trying to show, sell more golf shoes or whatever. So I don't know where I'm going with all this other than, um, uh, yeah, that's more, more, maybe a bit more to, you know, to it than just celebrities. And yeah. Yeah. Instagram so, so likes, I'm, right. Yeah. So just to wrap it up, I mean, I'm exposed to a lot of different people and places and events and, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of cool. And, you know, I'm, I'm digging it right now and I'm actually pretty challenged because for a long time, a lot of times, the more you do, the more of that kind of work you beget. So, you know, for five years, I was doing all the GoPro tutorials, uh, believe it or not. If you ever seen a white screen video of GoPro tutorial, this finger, you know, I used to have, I'd set up the studio, the shots, everything. And I'd go across the street to my gal and get a pedicure uh, or, or I'm sorry, a manicure, <laughs> uh, because this was, you know, under a macro lens, you know, you could see every little, you know, dead skin detail, but this finger is, was the button pressing finger for all those videos. Uh, but the point is, is that I did so much studio stuff for so long. I was like, that's most of the stuff I was doing. So now it's like, I'm kind of out of that. I'm challenged and I'm just all over the place working with, with, you know, people and products. And so it's, it's, uh, it's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. For somebody with ADD and, and who wants to travel, it's, uh, yeah, in a studio, it's, 
can be I can imagine it could be could be a little hard for um for for a while um you you follow much windsurfing these days um what's your what's your current windsurfing uh status yeah so that's that's actually a great question um i've struggled with social media the past several years um it's um how do i say this without sounding like super old and lame but um there's there's a time where i really despised it because i was such an early adopter like i did a lot of work with red bull when i had my my interactive agency before i really got into film and video and they were super early adopters of all social media of any kind right and, and certainly embraced it and um so i i was i was in the mix very early on from for a lot of that stuff and I just got to a point, I guess maybe watching my kids, you know, kind of get addicted to it, but like use it a lot where I was like, gosh, you know what? It can be used for a lot of great things, but it's like, there's just, it breeds so much like narcissism and, um, you know, just because you can, doesn't mean you should. And we've, you know, it's creating a generation of just, you know, just people that like, you know, are just snacking on content. That's just, you know, disposable, low qualities. I don't know. I, anyway, to answer your question, um, I do spend more time on, on social media now because of my current, you know, work situation, uh, more than I ever have. And I do follow a handful of guys, but I'm not on it every day. And I'm certainly not only, you know, it's like, I follow a lot of camera and video guys and tutorial, like I, I use it for things that, but, but some of the stuff I see on there is just absolutely unbelievable. Right. Like, so I, I see, I see as much of it as I want to consume. Um, you get out there, you get out there yourself much. I mean, you, yeah, you, say, um, you just say you're going to be in Maui. I mean, flat yep. season, but. Yep. You know. Yep. No, I, I am. And it's kind of like, it's our last little, um, you know, kind of family trip before my daughter goes to college. In, in the fall. So, um, I'm just stoked to be there and see people and maybe sail. I'm hoping to sail. Um, but in terms of me sailing around here, it's, I, it's a handful of times a year, sadly. It's like, I, um, it's like this spring has been, so I got one of my good buddies. He's a super geeks out on wind charts and tie, like everything. And he just sends me, you know, weather snapshots every day. And he's, he said, and I've seen it, like I've seen it cause I'm, you know, I'm here, but it's like, this is the best spring we've had on the coast in this area or in the Bay for 20 years. Like it's been going nuts. And, you know, sadly it's like, you know, I just haven't, um, haven't made much of a, much of an effort. And, um, you know, every spring I say, like, I want to sail so much more this year and life and work and kid, you know, things just get in the way. Uh, but I, I, I usually average about 10 times a year. However, uh, year before last, I did get a Windsor for LT and not to like go full circle back to my roots on a big board, but that thing does get me out there a bit more because I can take it to any lake, any bay, like anywhere and at least sail. And I don't need to go fast and jump high to feel fulfilled. Like just being out there and cruising is so cool. And you know, if there's no wind and I've been in places, I take it out. It's a paddleboard. Like I just, you know, so, um, that's actually got me on the water a bit more. And the other thing is where I live, there's great bay sailing, but if I want to go wave sailing, it's, you know, if I want to go into water Oak Creek or something, it's, you know, it's an hour it's and a half drive, plus yeah. way. It's a drive. It's just a big commitment. And, mm -hmm. um, you do live yeah, in the foiling capital of the world though. So maybe that's, a, maybe that's your answer. <laughs> yeah, no, there's the, the wing foiling around here is just like, just exploded. And then like every, in summertime, probably starting now, every like Thursday, every Thursday, they have the kite racing, which is crazy. You know, it's like, I've gone down there and watched the start before and they're all together on the start, all on foils, all going full speed kites in the air. Just you know, like, it gives me anxiety watching because it's just like, you think one person blows it and it's just going to be like, yeah, it pisses me uh, off because through my windsurfing career, we've always been on the forefront. Like we've always been the fastest and whatever. And like now we're foiling, but these guys are doing circles around us. So it's annoying. <laughs> but, um, what I want to ask, I wanted to ask something. Ah, yeah. You mentioned somewhere that you're going to leave the best stories for your, for your autobiography. When, that will, <laughs> when can we expect that? <laughs> well, 
I actually have been thinking a lot about that both this last year uh, because I have so much uh, content that was saved over the years uh, and that people have given me. You know, like I took I took a time of several years ago where I had boxes and boxes of VHS tapes, and I you know transferred them all to you know to digital and um, magazines and like I have so much content that if I lay it all out on the floor, like it, it's it's a, quite a timeline. Uh, and I just, I kind of need help with the script because I have an idea and I've jotted, you know, some things down, but I kind of help, I need someone to help shape that. And then I, you know, with, 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 with editing and storytelling, I, I have so many, you know, visuals to, to help support that. And I, and I, I want to do something not for any other reason than just kind of my, my, my inner circle to be like, Hey, this is this is kind of that, this is, a ch- this is the chapter of my life that really, that really changed my life. Cause it would have been very different if I, uh, you know, opportunities didn't come along with, with windsurfing. So, uh, once that's done though, you might as well put it on Netflix or some, somewhere. Yeah. I don't know what it was Netflix, <laughs> but like, I, I, you know, I'll, I'll, I'm going to get something out there because I've been, I've been thinking about it enough. It's interesting. You brought it up because that just kind of motivates me a little bit more, you know, to, to want to get that done. Yeah, you should, you should. There's, um, there's been, yeah, you know, through, through this podcast, there's been a lot of people asking about you and I think you influenced, you know, like a whole generation of windsurfers that, like you say, you know, that maybe weren't racers and weren't, and there's this freestyle thing, you know, and we can do, we can just have fun and, and, and yeah. And the movies and all that, you know, it's, it's a lot of groundbreaking stuff, you know? And the, the, the things I see you guys doing in freestyle, like whether it's on Instagram or on YouTube, like I, in my mind is so beyond blown. Like I can't figure some of the stuff out without stopping it and like scrubbing it, you know, a few front, what, Oh, the clue went that way through the wind. What the hell? Like, it's just, it just blows me away. Like what some of these guys are doing. And it's, um, that's it's another crazy. thing that sucks about Instagram. You can't bo- go frame by frame. It pisses me off. Yeah. Well, what you can do is you can do a screen recording on your phone, then your camera roll go and then scrub and go frame by frame. I've actually done that before trying to figure something out. I've been like, you know, I got, I got to know how this happened. So, uh, yeah, there's that. Um, I mean, the, the one thing I will say that I, I'm not a fan of, and I'm sure you know, it's probably not, not popular, maybe a little backlash. I think the foil freestyle stuff that I've seen is just the most ridiculous thing ever. And let me tell you why it's not because somebody like can do it. You know, it's, it's like, just because you can, like, doesn't mean you should. Like I see guys like popping off something and doing gigantic, you know, flips and just tomahawking the foil through the air. It doesn't look elegant. It looks forced. It looks incredibly dangerous. And it's like, why? Like why? Like even, even the best watermen in the world, like, I mean, no digs, like, like Ty Lanny or Zane Schweitzer, like they're jumping and doing like double flips with a foil. And I was like, dude, well, why? Like, I don't, you know, it just doesn't make any sense. So the freestyle foiling thing, I'm not, I'm not a fan of just yeah. just put that out there, but who cares? I'm an old guy now. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, I know it's there. There's, there's definitely something, something to it. Ian, um, Thanks so much for your time, man. I mean, I, I wish I squeezed out some more, you know, some more meat out of you, but um, we, well, we, we got something a lot more profound, I believe. So, so that's, that's good too, I think. <laughs> yeah, no, I appreciate you having me on. You know, it's like I going, sometimes going back 30, 30, 30, 40 years. Like I, there's, there's lots of little micro details that, you know, I'll remember after this and be like, Oh, I should have, mention that or, Oh, now I thought, you know, like that's going to happen. And, um, sadly that won't be in here, but I certainly, uh, appreciate your, your, your consideration and your time. And, you know, I hope there's a few little nuggets in here that might be kind of interesting to know, but, um, yeah, no, I mean, it's, uh, this is kind of a, a, a cool format, you know, in the sense that's like, you know, you could almost do like a, you know, you know, uh, you know, beers and boards or something, or, uh, uh, you know, those comedians writing cards or something where it's kind of That's a little cool, short yeah. format, but you collect like questions from, from fans or, or just people. And you just do a, you know, kind of a read through and we share a beer across the world and we talk about stuff, you know, like that kind of, that kind of format's also kind of, kind of cool, you know, cause you, 
you learn about people and hear stories that may not be from you know direct questions, right? Like beers and so, lords. That's a that's a that's that's a good title. Yeah. That's a good <laughs> title. In in Poland, in Poland, they have the the shot question. So every question is a shot. So that's okay. that's a little more. <laughs> you know, right. That right. might be a little yeah. A little more, yeah. more dicey, but anyway, yeah. thanks so much, man. We appreciate cool. you, yes. everything you've done for the sport and, um, and yeah, see yeah. you around somewhere. Hopefully. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, no, I'd love to, to be able to sail together one day. It'd be awesome. Appreciate it. Cheers, man. Yeah. Appreciate Good it. Good stuff. Okay. So there we go. Ian Boyd, did you enjoy that podcast? Do you want to see more old school guys and girls on the podcast? Let us know in the comments below. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, subscribe. We were doing a podcast every week, whether it's one with Matchek and the legends um, or whether it's me with a live podcast. Um, also, if you want to you know, chip in some beer money, you can do. Support the channel, help us produce these videos and keep the content flowing. Windsurfing is a very small sport, so any uh, help from you guys at home definitely helps. Um, and that's it. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you for the next one.